Welcome and good morning to our guests and panelists for today's discussion. I'm Oliver Ward and I'll be coordinating today's panel discussion. Today's, today's discussion will operate around the life of late Professor Daniel Plykis. We are honoring his life, his achievements and his legacy. Professor Daniel Plykis created this project, Servant Leader for Us Youth, which is his legacy project. Um, Servant Leader is a range of interviews uh, in which Professor Daniel Plykis interviews uh, a number of former South African leaders and present South African leaders um, during and after apartheid. In these interviews, Professor Daniel Plykis also asks concerning and beneficial questions. So as first time voters, we are able to learn from our leaders and form a stance and understanding of what a true servant leader is. And today we honor Uncle Daniel Plagis by wearing pink, his favorite color, with a hashtag stay black. And as I understand this phrase, it means that one should stay true to oneself and one's values, those that are important to you. And I would like to ask our guests to send messages of support to the family on our chat here in Zoom. And please um, send us some questions. We have a lovely team of panelists here who are eager to answer your questions. I will now hand over to our panelists to introduce themselves and to, and I ask them to add why they think that the Servant Leader series is important to follow and to watch. And we can start with the Lydia. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lydia Plikes. Um, I am Daniel Plikes' youngest daughter. Um, and the reason why I think that Servant Leader is an important series to watch is because um, I think the interviews bring great insight and knowledge into what was. I personally did not learn high school when I took history. Um, and I think it opened doors to different kind of conversations that should be had um, between youth, between anyone really who's interested in the state of the country and their future. So yeah, thank you, Oliver. Bali. I found this series so beneficial because it's created a platform for young activists such as ourselves to really connect with the generations that opened the doors before us, um, that really like catalyzed our position. Um, the reason that we can study the things that we study and be in the position that we're in. I'm currently a second year law student at the University of Cape Town. Um, I'm from Cape Town and I remember having a really great and esteemed relationship with Uncle Daniel when he was around. He was a paternal figure to all of Lydian's closest friends. Um, and it's it's really brilliant to know that he had left a legacy as significant, as substantial as this one um, for all of us to partake in. Lusanda. Hi, everyone. I am Lusanda Ngobo. And I really, really, really think this um, series has benefited me in the most remarkable way. As a first time voter, I'm just trying to find out more information and more insight and every single opportunity that I get to know something about the leaders in my country and who can help my decision making, I will take it. And um, I think the series will benefit others in that way because uh, trying to navigate and find information as a first time voter is quite difficult sometimes because you don't know where to look. But this series is a place where I think you can fully sit down, watch, listen and trust and ask questions. So that's really lovely. Prince, would you like to add? Um, good morning to all virtually present. My name is Prince David Borque. And it's absolutely an honor to be here again to represent the excellence within our youth and to be in participation with my fellow panelists as we bring forth um, 
the perspectives that minted Professor Blakey's foundation, and especially this formal um, platform expression. Um, for me personally, with regards to participation and engaging in the platform like the servant leader, I think it's quite imperative that we as the youth, not just as the youth, but as intellectuals that inspire to be excellent, that we get in tune with platforms like this, you know, because it breeds a better, a better understanding on what leadership is and how it can be um, sustained in a professional and ethical manner. Thank you. Nicholas? Good morning, everybody. My name is Nicholas Kruger. I am a um, he, they pronouns. I'm a 20 year old UCT student studying theater and performance and I would like to start by saying how honored I've been to take part in this process from almost the very beginning just honoring um, Daniel Professor Daniel Pikey's legacy um, especially now today talking finally talking about all the stuff that he has achieved and from what I learned personally from this process is just to echo from my fellow panelists is that learning about all learning examples of true leadership from all the people that we have discussed over these past few months, as well as like seeing and forging for myself what style of servant leader I'd want to see, especially now as a first time voter. Edith? My name is Edith Mugadza. I am a second year BSOC Sci student studying law and psychology. Um, I think there's project is very valuable because I think as the youth we are the future politically and just in general for this nation I think it's important for us to learn how to engage in these spaces and learn what it is that we have seen with leaders in the past and what is that we can hope to forge going forward I think this is an important discussion for us to engage in. Deborah? Hi everyone, my name is Deborah Kerr Paulson and I find this, um, this platform very beneficial, not just for myself, but I think we can all say that we learn so much and just the opportunity to be informed and get educated about the things um, like Lydian previously mentioned that we do not know. Um, and I also think it just, um, gives us so much more insight to figures that we might not have known about. So I think it's just a great opportunity for us to learn more and also find our voice and where we stand within this country and the leadership, the type of leadership we want to see. Thank you. Catherine? Hi, um, my name is Catherine Wood. Um, and as you know, my fellow, fellow panelists have said, I have felt so privileged to be a part of this. Um, I think it's so important to have discussions like this. Um, and talking from personal experience, it can be quite awkward to open up these kind of conversations, you know, at dinner tables um, and family events. But I feel like this platform has enabled um, family members, for example, to um, get involved in these kind of conversations and make it a bit, not more comfortable, because these conversations are never comfortable, but it's just opened a door um, to make it easier to talk about these kind of things. And um, on, on the website, it says that Professor Pleikes wanted to address the, the growing lack of ethical leadership in the country. And obviously as first time voters, it's just, I feel as though it's opened up my eyes um, specifically to, as everyone else has said, like the servant leadership and what you should be looking for and that kind of thing. And it's just, it's a very important, you know, project to be a part of. Thank you. David. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, just to add on to what you just said, I think that this is very informative. It opens up a portal of so much knowledge. And just to see that previous seven leaders and what they have done for us, it's very, very inspiring. And I feel like every one of us should always just go back and reflect so that we can shape our future as well. Thank you. 
I'm Oliver Ward and I'm studying at BCom Financial Accounting degree at the University of Cape Town. Um, this servant leader series has definitely taught us um, a variety of criteria that we can look for in a leader to vote for in this first our first elections um, as youth. And it also teaches us a bit of history about South Africa that we weren't taught at school. And now we have the opportunity to learn about our former leaders and present leaders who are still um, in business and government, various government sectors. I will now ask for uh, Lillian, David and Edith to elaborate on Professor Daniel Plakis's childhood and youth as well as his motivation to be a servant leader. We can start with Lydian. Um, so from what I understand, my father's childhood, he grew up in Bontierville. Um, He did not have the best um, lifestyle growing up. I remember he told me how he never had, there was never um, a surety of having food on the table um, and how he would sometimes follow his friends to, for hope that he would get um, food on the table, um, so that he would get supper for that day. Um, and I think that really um, set an, an, an underlining basis of how he treats everyone around him in terms of um, how he always cared for everyone and made sure that everybody was not only fed, but felt secure and safe in his presence. Um, he yeah, he had a huge heart, huge, huge heart. And I think that really, like his childhood really shaped um, who he became. Yeah, thank you. Um, David? Yeah, um, just to add on, like considering he lived in a place like Bontyville, even myself, I come from Mitchell's Plain, so I can resonate to his experiences and everything that he's been through. But the beautiful thing in this is that he rised up even though he was in the murky waters, he allowed love and light to pave the way and his curiosity got him places. And he can just show that he was so resilient. And me, I personally look up to him because if he can come through that, everybody can come through it because he's just this beauty in the struggle. And I really, I really love that about him. Edith? Uh, I think Professor Blackie's upbringing mirrors a lot of what happens in South Africa as a whole and I think it's motivated a lot of what's brought in on his work and like his academic goals as far as what he envisioned for the country and what he hoped to add to the country. I think coming from a position where socially the environment is not encouraging and uplifting it then encouraged him to create environments that were uplifting socially and economically to the greater South African nation. And I think that speaks to his motivation and his desire to uplift others and to create better leadership for the country and enable upliftment for others. Thank you, Edith. Um, I recently listened to an interview of Professor Daniel Black is on SAFM, where he speaks about his childhood and how he used to walk barefoot to school, even in winter and through long grass, and um, about how he used to keep his feet warm when he got to school. Um, it's, yeah, it was really remarkable about how he got out of that situation. Um, I will now ask for Mbali, Nicholas, and Deborah to discuss Professor Daniel Blakis's academic life. So as a youth until quite late into his life, we can start with Mbali. Well, Professor Plakis, um got a BA degree in social work at the University of the Western Cape. Um, he then followed it by getting an honors degree in social sciences at UCT and received his master's in philosophy at the University of the Western Cape, only to end up with a PhD in governance, public policy, 
and public finance at WITS. And I think besides him being the commendable father, husband, political leader that he was, the fact that he was an academic that strived for excellence and that really just exemplified how much knowledge is power is so remarkable and really definitely so heroic. Um, I think it should be enthused and emphasized more that you never stop learning, you know, and it, it, it's, it's really inspiring to know that someone like himself could accomplish so much in um, his short time here with us. Nicholas. Thank you. I would also like to mention that on top of already having a PhD in public governance, um, before Professor Flykies passed away, he was currently setting out to achieve and very close to getting his PhD in law. So not only was he going to have one PhD, he was going to have two. And as someone who is currently in the academic field, very low down the ladder, um, that's, I find that abs it's, it's, it's outstanding, brilliant, it's, it's mind-blowing. Um, just take a, um, a quick look at what he, what he did in his PhD in public governance. His dissertation was uh, specifically on how South Africa's decentralized government of, of cooperative governance was in fact not truly decentralized. I mean, he, 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 when he goes on to talk about how the cons that the provinces of South Africa are only decentralized as according to the paper, as extensions of the central government power. It's like these esoteric insights that, that Professor Flykies brings just, just furthers all of his contributions. Debra? I would just like to um, continue on what Mbali and Nicholas said. Um, so when I was doing or getting to know a bit more about his academic life, um, I was trying to find out how these professions um, interlinked with one another. And it was just so wild to me when I found out that they all have people in common. So society, community, humanity. And um, it's just so admirable how, how clear it is to see that his passion and his aspiration and urgency lied within the well-being of the South African people and their well-being, and also just how solutions can come forth um, to the struggles that they face. Because Lillian, you mentioned already that his upbringing wasn't um, so fancy and um, you know posh as one would think when you have all of these degrees and all of these qualifications. But I truly believe that his passion and his or his passion and his aspiration to use that knowledge and to use the platforms that um, his academic life created for him um, was just it's just so amazing to see that he gave back and he used that to serve as a leader um, and bring social change, you know, because at the end of the day, that was um, also one of his goals and the visions he had in mind. Thank you, Deborah. Um, Professor Daniel Black has also published uh, two books before his passing. Um, I can't think of the names right now, but I think it was about future inheritance. But I know he was wor working on more other books. One was recently published last year, I believe, at the beginning of this year. Um, so yeah, on top of his academic qualifications, he also published books and wrote books and did research. Um, I would now like to ask for Prince Catherine and Lusanda to give us their insight into Professor Daniel Plakis's careers, his uh, numerous positions as a public servant of South Africa. And we can start with Prince. Oh, thank you, Oliver. Um, so Professor Plakis has served in various senior positions in the national and provincial government. And he has also served in various full-time employed positions um, to middle, to senior, and to executive management. 
um, within his field of operation. And I would like to go into more insight on the year 2017 to 2020, when he was appointed to be the chairperson of the Financial and Fiscal Commission. So the commission's primary objective is to make recommendations to parliament, on, um, to the provincial and local government on, on financial and fiscal matters um, that is in bias with the constitution. So for me personally, I feel like this was a huge um, opportunity given to him um, by the president. And I feel like this is one of his, one of his heights. You know, I feel like he was just getting started with his career as well. Um, uh, and what Oliver said in terms of his books is he is also like he's the author and the editor of Future Inheritance, Building State Capacity in Democratic South Africa. And also the other book is Protecting the Inheritance. Um, yeah, that's the other book that he wrote. And um, he's also uh, authored several government publications and articles contributing to the public um, intellectual discourse on government and many public um, public um, fi fi financial um, publications. And yeah, and <clears throat> he's also, uh, he was also the uh, ministerial advisor to the Minister of Public um, Public Enterprises. And in 2014, 2015, he was also the executive director, uh, which included democracy, governance, and service, um, which of the Human Rights Research Council. Thank you. Thank you, Prince. Uh, Catherine? Um. I just think that it's amazing um, that while he was working in all of these, you know, executive positions um, and furthering his career, that he was also, you know, studying towards getting his PhD and writing books um, and numerous other activities that revolved around um, growing a forest of democracy, um, as Trevor Manuel described it, which I thought was a really, a really great quote which described and kind of encompassed everything that Professor Pleikes was trying to do um, in like furthering servant leadership and benefiting the country as a whole. Um, and yeah, it also said that his vision was to find the best version of leadership that serves the people of South Africa. And you can see by his career path that he was, he not only believed in that, but he lived it too, um, as he found his niche you know, serving the people of his country, um, which I just think is, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Lucinda? Uh, I think both of my panelists have mentioned quite a few uh, career highlights of his life, but I'd like to also highlight um, how Professor Blakey's was as Prince said, the full-time chairperson of the Financial and Fiscal Commission, which is honestly a big deal. Um, he worked at the University of Free State, uh, WITS. He worked in the health system policy in Gauteng, the Gauteng provincial government. Also worked within the Free State provincial government. He was a senior manager in the public finance unit of the National Treasury, another big deal. Um, the special advisor of ministers, I have a whole long list of his achievements, um, was in the HSRC, uh, working as the executive director, and on top of all of this, I can appreciate how he was an amazing father and husband, because those are careers <laughs> in itself, and it's very visible, as I've had many interactions with Lydian, Auntie Lydia, and um, Darnell. It's just incredible to see his influence within the family and how he's impacted them. And through them, I can feel him. Thank you, Lysander. Um, it was a good point you made about him being a father as a career path. Um, our next point on the agenda is I would like to ask our panelists what they have learned from Professor Daniel Plagis directly, or perhaps as um, reading on the servant leader side, 
if you haven't met him before. Um, and both professionally and on a personal level. So if anyone would like to add to that. Catherine? Um, I think on a professional level, I just, I think it's really, really inspiring and honestly iconic um, <laughs> that he really proved that anything is possible. Because um, when you consider where he came from and, you know, how he was brought up and it really seemed like all of the odds were stacked against him, but he overcome, he overcame everything. Um, you know, like as a as a black man growing up in South Africa during the apartheid era, it just it really seemed like, you know, maybe he'd have to struggle really hard during life and he just, you know, overcame everything and achieved so much. Um, and it's really, really amazing. Um, and then personally, I think the fact that he was always like speaking about and looking for the truth. Um, as it said multiple times, no matter how much he was ignored or anything, um, he really, his main objective was looking for the truth. And I think that also links in with the um, hashtag stay black on our, on our t-shirts, um, that he stayed true to himself and everything that he believed in, um, no matter what the odds were. And I think that's really inspiring. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Prince would like to say something. Um, for me personally, um, it's the consistency within his passion of ethical works and leadership sustainability that sent out the right message to a future entrepreneur like myself, you know, not just to provide a better standard or quality of life to my family, but to the economy of South Africa, you know, um, the people living in South Africa and put them first um, because in a sense, in essence, um, we all are family. So for me, I, I took that from him and I feel like um, that's one of the things that stood out for me that, you know, his work is sustainable, meaning that a person like me can come into this field and continue his work through excellence. Thank you. Thank you, Prince. Mbali, would you like to add? Um, I was thinking professionally that one of the biggest takeaways from Uncle Daniel's work is the fact that he managed to cultivate a career, essentially, and like a, a job, I mean, a legacy out of his passion, which is amazing because, you know, people tell you to follow your dreams and that, um, you know, the, the, the income or the salary, the financial stability will follow. And that's exactly what he did. He wasn't just box ticking his way through life, doing the jobs that pay the bills. He was doing ethical work. He was doing work that we can all appreciate now, that we all benefit from now, um, which I think is extraordinary. Um, but personally, I remember the way that he would advocate for those who felt voiceless and really just empowered people um, through conversation, through engagement. He had an ability to make people feel seen, um, which is something that I would like to bring out in others. It's something that I, I can take away and, and only wish that I could make people feel as comfortable around me as he did um, around him. And um, to just have that kind of paternal figure was really something that I hold very close and think about often just because of how he really stood out for like me and Lydian's friends. Um, yeah, just an all-rounded, like fantastic person, just a really great human being. Thank you, Mbali. Um, Edith, would you like to add? Um, so unfortunately, I never got to personally meet Professor Blackies, but uh, in researching for this and understanding him better through my research, I, I came to 
to realize that he had done this really incredible thing where he had overcome this assumption that a lot of people have that you can't really have everything as far as what you do in this life. I think on top of engaging with learning and academics as seen by his PhD, but also his pursuance of the second PhD, he also cultivated this strong family life and also this like, very formidable career and this legacy that is going to be remembered long after him. And I think that on itself is incredible. I think professionally, we can look at what he does for the country and the core that he continues to have for the rest of us to do what we can, um, even as we move further and further from the 1996 landmark, I think it's now looking into what we can do to better the country and build this nation and to continue to provide and be there for others and to show ethical leadership and show servant leadership in all that we do and the way that we continue to influence politics as young people, but also as the leaders that we have currently and who we choose to give those powers and opportunities, opportunities to. And then personally, it was just remarkable to me, all of the accounts of what a kind and bold spirit that he was. I think that of all the people who, all the interviews and all of the accounts that people gave of him, he was this person who was just unforgettable. And the way that he would touch people and the way that he would bring out a liveliness in others was remarkable. And then you can see that in the way that they continue to speak about him and the way that they recount stories of him and his travels and his learning and his like, impact as a father, as a leader, as an educator. I think it's something that a lot of us can take to heart and try and mold in ourselves. I know myself, I would love to be able to cultivate that type of kindness and joyfulness, but also rigor and hardworking spirit to all that I do. Thank you, Edith. Um, I've also had a few personal experiences with Uncle Daniel. I remember the first time I met Uncle Daniel in 2015. Um, it was June. It was um, at Full Unistrift Winery. I remember the day. It was a wacky wine weekend in Robertson. I don't know if anyone knows um, what that is. Um, so I immediately noticed his humility when he interacted with us. Um, and I think that kind of goes into his career and his work in academics and, his, and drives his passion. And on a professional level, he inspires me and inspired me um, even while he was still alive about how I should always put in 110%, you know, um, always be ethical and perhaps always speak truth to power, as he said, and not be afraid that your opinion is not the norm or the popular, the most popular in the room. So you should never be shy to provide your opinion because that's what you believe in. So our next talking point is what kind of action um, can you take today to ensure a better future for yourself and others? And a sub question is, what is the future of the legacy project for first time voters? If anyone would like to add to that, they're welcome. Um, I can say a bit, I think, what I understood of my dad's life is that it's very much like everyone is saying that his passion is what drove him um, and his love for people is also what drove him. I think it's also um, as stressful as his jobs were, I think the fun that he had while doing it was also, is, I feel like was just um, something that's not overwhelmed as he was at some point. Um, there was this fun and this passion that came with helping people. And I think that that's what we can learn as the youth in terms of how we shape South Africa in the future is not only doing what's right, but making sure that what we're doing it is not um, just to tick some boxes, but to do it like through passion, through love, through humility, with fun, yeah.
Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. Um, Nicholas, would you like to add? Thank you, Oliver. Um, well, I would just like to also say that or hearing all of this about Daniel Plyke's really makes me wish that I was able to meet him in person. This just gives so much more credence to the, the brilliant man that he was and his legacy continues to live on. Um, the way I, I see a future legacy for a project involving first time voters is, is, is creating or furthering it by constantly reminding people and constantly um, creating an understanding that as this, because of the political system that we currently work in, voting is not even, is not even a choice. It, it has to be, because it's the only way any of us can make any effective choice um, change within the, within the, within the system. Um, mass, um, excuse me, mass drives to get as many people to the polls to accurately represent the makeup of our country. Um, it's very, it's very jarring to see that sometimes in, in national elections, you only have 60% of the, of, of the voting population actually voting, because that means 40% of those of people who are enshrined that have taken part in our democracy as per our laws and our values aren't taking part of the democracy. How could you call it a legitimate um, government and legitimate representation of South Africa and South Africans when, when few people, when not all of us are taking part in it. I believe that it should be a campaign to push those in power to make sure that everybody is represented and everybody takes part in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Deborah, would you like to add? Yes, I would just like to echo um, Nicholas. I think it's very important and that's what this um, platform has created personally for me is to get involved and to get educated and to, to inform yourself with um, the situation that we're in, the country that we live in, um, the leadership um, that we currently have. Um, and I'd like to add, because I didn't, um, say what I, because I didn't know um, Professor Daniel Plakis personally, but what I did learn from him um, is to become the leader that you want to see. Um, and I think a servant leader is someone that's involved. It's someone who, um, who educates themselves so that they also can learn um, what part can they play. And so I think um, this is such an important and beneficial um, platform and it's created the opportunity for me to get to know more about um, the type of leadership that I want to see. So I think um, it's very important that Nicholas raised that point that we need to get involved. You know, we can't just sit at the back seat and keep quiet. We need to get involved. We need to become bold because I truly believe that um, Professor Daniels, he had intimidating moments, but that didn't stop him from being bold because you can be bold and you can still be in, you can be bold and intimidated at the same time, but the courage, you should still have the courage to, to use your voice and to partake. Thank you, Debra. Lucinda? I'd like to echo something that someone said earlier, and that is consistency I feel as though and I'm really guilty of this so I have moments where I am loud really really loud about something because it's happening in that moment but what I should be doing is fighting for that or working towards something consistently every single day and I think Prof Daniel Plague he's did that throughout his life there was a there was a goal there was intention and he always did that, as Lydian said, with love, humility, respect, all the good things. And um, for this legacy project, I think that's what we can remind ourselves to do. Just keep that consistency reminder in our heads to say that, okay, we have this thing going. When it's good, when it's growing and, it, and it's really good, we should push even further and broadcast and engage even more and tell more people about it. Like Deb said now, be even louder and push a hashtag like this to stay black. 
Thank you, Lucinda. Edith? I think when looking at the future of this legacy project, especially when we have a youth that feel a little bit disengaged or disillusioned with South African politics at current, I think it's important for us to continue to have these engagements and discussions because I don't think the answer to any of our problems is to disengage and to kind of just act as if politics isn't the main vehicle for change within the country and for creating the leadership that we'd like to see and for empowering the leadership that we'd like to see. I think with Nicholas's point on the fact that you have elections where it's like 60% of people, I think that also speaks to that idea of disengagement where people aren't seeing the ethical leadership that they want and so they're choosing instead to step back and we don't necessarily, we don't solve the problems that we have when people step back. We need to encourage people to want to engage in these discussions and to want to continue to engage in these debates so that we can create leaders that we want and we can empower the leaders that we want and we can disempower the leaders who are no longer serving the public and who are no longer speaking to the issues that we have currently within the country. Thank you, Edith. Lydian would like to also add further. Um, yeah, I would just like to echo what my panelists have said. Um, I think there's also this, um, this mindset that's, that's um, going around in terms of the youth of what politics is. It's kind of like this isolated, um, like, like career or thing that's happening in South Africa, or in the world that only a few people are a part of, or only a few people can like actually have conversations about. And I, I will admit I used to be one of those people. And then my father made me realize that politics is not this thing that's isolated. If you care about people, if you care about your well-being, if you care about the people around you, if socially, if it's economically, culturally, whatever it is environmentally, that is politics in itself. So if you care about those things, you care about the politics of the country. And I think there's like by isolating politics into this whole um, isolated area, I think that's what the youth is, some of the youth is also getting wrong as well, that they don't want to get involved in politics because it's seen as this um, negative and, 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 and evil, like cloud that's so like that's in the world when it's not that politics encapsulated every encapsulates everything in our life the water that we drink the places that we sit the pens that we write with everything is politics and i think that's also something that we need to get right as a youth thank you Redin, for your input Mbali, would you like to add I really like what Lydian said about politics actually getting a bad rap for something that a lot of people don't really understand and forms every single sphere of your life. Um, politics is intersectionality. Politics is identity makeup. Politics is what affects where we live. It affects like what we're studying, where we're studying it, why we have access to those types of things. And to opt out of politics is to choose privilege. It's to choose that. I mean, I've always really um, resented the term ignorance is bliss because ignorance is bliss, but it is also privileged because you are affording yourself the right to not want to know certain things or not to have to talk about certain things just because they don't affect you. And that's selfish because that's not how the world works. Um, and yes, selfish people are rewarded all the time. We see it with billionaires using disposable income. We see it with corruption and like the state of our country, but that isn't ethical. And that's not who we want running our country. We're all here, we're all informed because we wanna be leaders in our communities, be it local, be it in law, be it legislation, be it in theater. Um, and our politics are gonna inform those careers and the life decisions that we make. And to, to merely decide that you don't want to be involved in it is not only ignorant, but irresponsible. Um, the struggle heroes that we've interviewed that we've been watching in these panels, like month after month, all fought for a civic responsibility that we have to vote 
So we have to, we have to get ourselves out there and partake in this democracy. Otherwise, what was it all for? What did the Professor Daniels of the World do this for? What did your grandparents do this for? Yeah. Thank you, Mbali. Um, we have a question from our guests. If you could describe le your learnings from Professor Daniel Plaikis with just one word or phrase, what would it be? Anyone might answer this question? Um, I will. Mine is stay black, which is stay confident, stay in humility. So yeah, mine would be stay black. <laughs> Uh, mine would be consistency within one's passion. Yeah. Catherine? Um, I think mine would be always seek the truth. Mbali? I would say empowerment. Nicholas. Diligence, because of his because of his sheer his diligence in doing whatever he he felt and knew to be right. Um, Daniel, Ach, David, sorry. I would say resilience because of his never said I attitude. Deborah. I'd say do your part because we all have a role and we all have a part um, to play. And Professor Daniels, he showed us an example and we can just take from that and run full force in ours. Lucinda. I would say fear of knowledge is foolishness. And I learned that last Sunday. And Edith? I would say that there's still work to be done, um, both in terms of the legacy project, but also the country as a whole. There's still so much to be done in empowering or providing to everyone. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from our guests. As first time voters, what would you say to people who say that there is no credible party to vote for in the country? If anyone would like to add. I would like to add, I think that's a good excuse. Um, because um, I think anyone you could say in any part of our history that there was no credible party and i'm not saying that i'm not going to try and advocate for a certain party but i think by saying that there's no credible parties that you're just only listening to um the um what's called now side of what the media is giving you what the drama and the rumors that are coming up the headlines you're not actually going into the depths of the uh, manifestos that are being written by every single party. Because if you think about it, there's not only three parties in South Africa, there are So if you think that there's no credible party, then you're thinking, then you're only looking at the headlines that are being handed to you, not actually looking yourself. So I think that's a good excuse to say that there's no credible party. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia and Edith. Adding to what Lydian was saying, I think that's 100% true. I think across the globe, there is no such thing as a perfect political party. And I think that we as South Africans often like to like, degrade our political system and try and like, in comparison to everyone else in the world say, oh no, we're falling behind in a way that no one else is. When in reality is you get corruption and almost every country in the globe. Like there is no such thing as the perfect politician or there is there the perfect political party. However, there are parties that speak to values that you may have. 
and you need to sit down and research and identify who those people are. They don't not exist. I don't think it's possible that there isn't a political party that doesn't at least speak to some of the values that you have and some of the values and the goals that you want this country to work towards. I think to argue that there is no such thing or that there's too, the, the, walk, the waters of politics are too murky is to just be lazy and to just decide to, when you have this political power and you have this opportunity to vote. Thank you, Edith. There's another few questions. Um, I'll see if I can fit them all into the time that we have. It, the next question is, how can we get today's government officials to be servant leaders and not just politicians focused on short-term and self-serving goals? If anyone would like to add. Sorry, I'm just going to answer. Um, I think I'm a proud believer that you can't, you can't force people to do something that they, they no longer can do themselves. Um, I think when it comes to someone being ethically responsible, someone actually being like a humanitarian, actually caring about what they're doing in such a position as a government position, I think all that we can do as the people of South Africa is hold people accountable um, to try and steer them on keeping them focused on what they should be doing and what that actually led them to be voted in those positions is simple. If they're not doing those, then they need to be voted out. And I, we can't force them to do those things. We can't. They're adults. Simple. Like if you get to vote, you're an adult, which means that you, you are sound minded to vote for and to do the things that needs to be done for the right reasons. So, yeah. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, okay. Um, here's another question. How do you feel about voting for independents? So I'm assuming independent candidates for local government elections. So if anyone would like to add to that question. Bali, would you like to add? Um, this one is tricky because in South Africa, we vote for parties. We don't vote for independent like political figures to be our, you know, our presidency. Um, so we can only, as Edith has actually emphasized, vote for parties that we feel that we resonate with their manifestos. And I personally am not a fan of voting for an independent person. I think it would be easier in terms of holding somebody accountable, right? Because parties won't take um, accountability for the mess ups on their behalf. Something like us getting Jacob Zuma out of the seat of presidency wasn't about kicking out the ANC, it was about getting him out of the position. So to that extent, it might be conducive However, I just don't see it working in the long term because our democracy operates on a different system to every other country. I think our history is too rich. I think we have too many issues to be um, almost like individualizing people as leaders because we need a subset of people to hold accountable. We don't need a scapegoat. We don't need one person. Thank you, Mbali, for your valid point there. Um, another question or statement, rather, keeping Daniel's legal um, oh, thank you. Um, keeping Daniel's legacy alive, what are the next step for the youth? So if anyone would like to add to that, I will come to. Uh, Dave. Yeah, I can add. Um, I feel, I feel as though the youth needs to implement execution to the daily lives. Like without ex execution, you know, 
one cannot persevere in in that manner because we we need to start executing and and stop that thing of just thinking everything through the consciousness and just start implementing what we have in our minds so that what we have can start businesses and those businesses can stimulate growth within our economy so i feel like as the youth we just need to start executing as of tomorrow thank you prince um is there anyone else would like to add to that question Nicholas? Just to round from what people have been saying on the panel so far, it's this idea of getting people to, to, take, to take part in the democracy, to take part in our society, whether it be voting, whether it be um, setting up cooperatives and, and working for workers' rights to working from grassroots level to up so that we can take um, we can handle all the problems that our country faces from 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 different directives, not just from the the official or the, the standard way of going about it. Instead, helping our own communities and getting involved in our own communities. Thank you, Nicholas. I would just like to read one of the statements from the chat. Um, a comment made, I lost my vocal cords to cancer and I'm alive. Such a powerful conversation when I die one day. This is the legacy I strive to live up for. So Professor Daniel Plyke is still inspired today. Another question from the chat is, in the case of Zuma, is he not the scapegoat when the party should be held accountable for the arms deal? as an example. So could I ask for David to add to this? Uh, in terms of this, I'm not really informed about this. I don't think I'll be the right person to answer this question. Um. Edian, would you like to add? Um, I was just thinking about it because my timeline on um, the whole Zuma debacle with the ANC is not extremely accurate. But I think what Mbali was specifically trying to point out is in terms of the timeline um, and how Jacob Zuma was seen as a scapegoat to what everything was going wrong in the ANC. And only afterwards was the ANC then being pushed or like being then investigated in what's happening within the party. Um, but I understood what Mbali had said in terms of a scapegoat. Um, but other than that, my, my knowledge is not extremely accurate. Yeah. Thank you, Lydia. Um... Mbali, would you like to add? Yeah, I think with the, the Zoom example that I made, and I agree with the comment that was made, he was appointed the scapegoat in terms of us putting him in this like public like persecution, you know? We were like, oh, Zoom is so bad and he's corrupt, which he is, but he cannot make decisions for our country solely by himself, which is why some like celebration glorification of our current president, Sil Ramaphosa, there are still things, there are still inadequacies on his side and criticisms that we need to hold him accountable for. And, and I mean crimes, I mean legitimized things. So the, the point that I was trying to emphasize was that while it might be easier to hold a person accountable when they're an independent figure, it is the state's party that we needed to be fighting, that we should have been advocating to get at the position that they were in 
Um, it was the ANC that empowered Jacob Zuma to do the things that he did, to commit the crimes that he does. And they got the lesser blow because they managed to get him as the scapegoat for something that had on a systemic and institutional level had failed the country collectively. Thank you, Mbali. Um, we are running short on time, so I'll give everyone a, a last chance to say a few words. So if anyone would like to start. Nicholas. Once again, I just want to say how honored I am to be a part of this process from almost from the very beginning. And it's been such a pleasure and such a privilege to get to know someone as brilliant and outstanding as uh, Professor Daniel Clayton. And my heart goes out to my friend Lydian and to Auntie Lydia and the whole family for, for sharing what a beautiful human uh, Professor Daniel Clark is, is with us. Uh, Prince? Um, first of all, I would like to just say my condolences to the Clark his family. Um, it's tough, but death is the inevitable and we need to see it as a as a good thing, not as a bad thing. Um, also, Lydian, um, <clears throat> with that feelings and emotions, um, it it it'll be good to channel ch channel that 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 feeling and emotion towards your dancing, you know. Um, to Auntie Lydia, um, sorry for your loss, and I just wish the best for your family um, for the next days to come. And I hope that I can continue um, being of service to the servant leader for the next days to come. Thank you. Um, Bali. Um, I'd just like to extend my support and love and light to your family, uh, Lillian. Um, you know how much your father meant to me. Oh, okay. I can't get emotional. You know how much your father meant to me and um, the paternal figure that he was to everybody. Uh, literally, the first time I met him, uh, he told me, because <laughs> I'd lost my dad like two weeks prior, um, that he would always be in my corner in the way that a dad should. Um, and he was to us and obviously to you and these beautiful girls. Um, and I know our dads are together now. And I'm probably proud that their girls are working as hard as we do. Um, so, yeah. Oh, I love you so much. Uh, David? Yeah, just to add on, although Professor Plati can't be here with us physically, spiritually he's still within all of our hearts. And I'm very grateful that he has planted the seed in my heart. And hopefully from your fast can grow. So long live Professor Plaki, long live. Edith. Lydia, Lydian, and the rest of the Plaki's family. Grief is, it's not easy. Losing a loved one is incredibly difficult. Uh, it comes in waves. It's both a mixture of great joy and getting to know them and having known them and sadness. And I wish you nothing but love and life and strength as you continue to go through those waves. Uh, a big thank you for this opportunity and to be able to hold true to the legacy of him and his men message and his story and what he hoped to achieve and I'm just thankful to be able to continue his name and to continue his legacy. Lucinda? I'd just like to encourage all the guests and anyone who's looking to join these panel discussions to go back and watch the interviews and watch the previous panel discussions to see what we talk about because it really is so beneficial. Whoa. And to Lydian and Auntie Lydia, thank you so much for extending your kindness and support towards me. It really is appreciated and I know it is a reflection of Professor Daniel Blackheath. 
Moving on. <laughs> and Deborah? Um, I just want to um, say that my heart goes out to Lily, Lydian and Auntie Lydia. Um, I can't even imagine um, what you're going through. So I, my prayers go out to you. And I just want to thank you so much for continuing his legacy, because if it wasn't for you continuing this legacy, I wouldn't get to know more about him and what his vision was. And um, yeah, um, Lusanda mentioned it so beautifully. We should, we should continue um, the legacy of um, Professor Daniel Pikey. So I'm so honored and I'm just so thankful for the opportunity. Catherine? Yeah, well, what's left to be said now? Um, <laughs> but yeah, just as everyone else has said, this it's honestly one of the hardest things um, a family can go through and yeah you guys have been doing an amazing job in continuing his work um, and you would honestly be so proud of um, just everything you guys have put into this um, on his behalf and in his memory it's it's amazing work um, that the Plikis family is doing to honor him and yeah, just sending all of my love and support. <laughs> yeah. Lydian. Um, it was making me a bit teary. Um, but I just want to say thank you to everyone um, for all the love and especially for this panel discussion as well. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> my dad would be very, very honored to have met all of you as well. So, yeah. Thank you, Lydian. I would also I'd just like to say thank you for this opportunity to uh, coordinating today's panel discussion. It was an honor to um, have your father as the subject for today. And um, he inspires me still to this day to work hard and be an ethical person while I work. And I would like to say thank you for um, all our guests who are joining us today. And thank you to our panelists who contributed today. And that is the end of today's discussion. Thank you.